I'll be good. Um, so this time I'm going to talk about uh, language modeling, uh, a task, and efficiency and training tricks. Um, and I'm going to go through a lot of material, but the material I go through is going to be rather basic uh, in terms of neural network stuff. So if you've already used neural networks for some tasks, um, a lot of it might be familiar to you, but it still might be useful to hear it one more time and, and think about it. Um, so let me uh, set up my slides. Okay. So um, I talked about uh, this last time, these acceptability judgments where we all uh, played together and decided whether these sentences are okay or not. Um, so Jane went to the store, store to Jane went the, uh, Jane went to store, Jane go to the store, the store went to Jane, the food truck went to Jane, etc. And some of these you know, were clearly ungrammatical. Some of these were ungrammatical in some languages in the world, but not others. Uh, some were semantically wrong or at least semantically questionable. Um, so language modeling uh, is calculating the probability of a sentence. And when we say we're calculating the probability of the sentence, basically we want to model the distribution of uh, sentences in terms of how likely they are to appear in a language. Um, so this conflates all of these things together. It conflates syntax, it conflates semantics. It even just conflates uh, frequency. So, you know, hello and Jane went to the store are both perfectly valid sentences, but hello is more frequent. So um, it would get a higher language model probability. So the way we calculate the probability of the sentence, we assume the sentence is called x. Um, we want to calculate the probability of big X. And the most common way to do this is um, to calculate it from left to right by taking the previous words and calculating the next word. And I assume that you know, most people here have taken some sort of NLP class or are at least familiar with it, so this should hopefully look uh, somewhat familiar to you. So this is the next word, and this is the context. Um, there's a particular name for this type of modeling. Um, does anyone know what it is? Autoregressive. autoregressive, yes. So this is called an autoregressive model. Um, and what an autoregressive model is, is it basically predicts the next words based on the predictions that you've made for the previous words. Um, I'm not going to go very uh, in depth into the, this class, but we're going to talk about uh, this a little bit more in, in, in new classes. So then um, there's a reason why we do this. Uh, the reason why we do this is because um, Predicting the probability over a whole sentence, there's an exponential or infinite number of sentences that we could possibly express in English, and it's hard to build a classifier over an infinite number of things if you just say, um, I want to predict uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's likely or not. Um, however, uh, if we say limit the size of our vocabulary, we say our vocabulary size is limited to 40,000 words. Um, or we say maybe even our vocabulary size is limited to all the characters in Unicode and you predict the next character one at a time, then this becomes a fixed size classification problem uh, which is relatively easy to solve using the techniques that I talked about last time. Um, but then the big problem becomes um, how do we predict the probability of the next word? Um, and the probability of the, predicting the probability of the next word is obviously not easy. It's not easy even for humans, but we'll, uh, we'll try to do our best. So I'm, I'm doing a new thing in this class this year, uh, which I mentioned briefly before, which is that we're, uh, we're covering, um, we're trying to measure how well we cover all the concepts that appear in research papers in NLP. Um, so I've started putting this on the website. You can go take a look if you want. But the, uh, the purple bars are the ones that we've already covered. So we talked about text classification last time. Uh, the red bars are the ones that we're going to cover this time. And the blue bars are the ones we haven't covered yet, but hopefully we'll cover most of them by the end of the class. Um, so this is on the, uh, the web page for this, uh, this uh, sites class. Also, um, the, the web page caches on your computer, so sometimes when I update the web page, uh, you can't see the new one. So if you can't see it, reload the page. Uh, I haven't figured out how to fix this, but um, there's probably 50 people in this room who could uh, tell me how to uncache my web pages. So if you want to tell me how, then that would be good. Um, but anyway, so uh, this is on the most recent version of the web page, uh, and you can take a look if you want. Okay. So first, I'm going to start out with a non-neural model. And the reason why I'm going to start out with a non-neural model is I think language modeling is maybe one of the best examples of 
um, of why neural models are so powerful for modeling language. And um, there's, knowing about this problem is actually what convinced me to use neural networks in the first place. So um, a little bit about my personal research story. I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember uh, when neural networks became popular for NLP. And um, when they first came out, I was a little bit skeptical, which is like, these things are not very interpretable. Um, you don't know what's going on inside of them. You're not going to be able to debug them well. Um, but there's a very nice paper, which I forget whether I um, listed it on the website. Oh, no. I don't have any chalk. OK, I have a tiny, I have a tiny bit of chalk. OK, awesome. So um, there's a very nice paper um, from a long time ago called A Bit of Progress in Language Modeling. Um, and um, this is a paper by an excellent uh, researcher named Joshua Goodman, at, uh, who was, at, I guess, at Harvard or IBM at the time. And he, uh, he took these language models and tried to fix all the problems with them by uh, using a whole bunch of different tasks, uh, a whole bunch of different methods. Um, and then we didn't have neural networks, so he had to do a lot of different things. Um, but the, the paradigm he was working in was count-based language models. Um, and specifically, the count-based language models, again, uh, if you've taken algorithms for NLP, you're very familiar with these. Um, if you've taken another NLP class, they're standard n-gram language models. And the way they work is you, um, you count up the frequency of word sequences and you divide by the context. So um, if you look here, we have um, the frequency of the previous n words and the word we want to predict, or sorry, previous n minus 1 words and the word we want to predict. And um, based on that, we calculate the probability of the next word. And uh, this is maximum likelihood. Uh, this is the way you do maximum likelihood estimation for n-gram models. Um, and if you had infinite data and you were only allowed to look at the previous n minus 1 words, this would be the perfect way of modeling. You wouldn't need anything more than this uh, because you would just count up all the data. You would generate infinite data according to the process you want to generate it from. And there's no better estimator than the maximum likelihood estimator um, in, in this way. So it would be a great um, method, just like neural networks are a great method, except we have limited data, right? Um, we don't have enough data to me measure this. So um, because of this, um, it's very likely that you're going to get zero counts. Uh, you're going to get a context where it says, um, Graham is giving a lecture on, and uh, maybe I've given a lecture on neural networks for NLP, but then I decide I want to give a lecture on, um, who knows, multilingual processing, and I'd never given one of those before. So in that context, you'd never, you'd give multilingual zero prob probability and never be able to uh, predict that. So, there are things like backing off uh, to lower orders, uh, forgetting a few words in, in the previous context, et cetera, that people used to be with this. And um, there's a method that's widely used in n-grams. You don't need to know what it is, but if you know what it is, then that's great. It's um, called modified finesse or smoothing that you know, eventually people settled on to solve this. Um, so in the language modeling task, um, how do we tell if our language model is a good language model or not? And basically, the answer is, how well does it predict the probability of similar of, uh, you know, language data? And um, specifically, if we, uh, if we name our sentence E here, and we have a large set of test data separate from our training data, um, we can just calculate the log probability on this test data and, uh, and measure how good the model is. And I think, you know, from the point of view of language modeling, the goal of a language model is to predict the probability of textual data. Uh, so this is a pretty good measure of how good the model is itself. Um, and um, another thing you can do is you can measure per word log likelihood. So you divide the number of, um, you divide the log likelihood by the number of words. Uh, the reason why you would do this is if you have a test set of uh, 5,000 words and then you have another test set of uh, 50,000 words, 
um, you'd like to have an overall idea of how good the model is across those two test sets. And this number would be 10 times larger for a test set that's 10 times the size, right? So divide by the number of words. Um, there's also a per word uh, cross entropy. Um, and basically what this is, is this is um, the taking the negative of the log likelihood. Um, and sometimes you, uh, you take the log two. And the reason why you take the log two is because there's a very um, strong connection between this entropy and in information theory, how small can you compress the data according to a probabilistic model. So essentially the entropy of the entire data set is if you had a perfect data compression algorithm is also the number of bits that you would need to use to compress the data set according to that algorithm in this probabilistic model. And actually this um, a bit of progress in language modeling is a pun. So this bit is like a bit of entropy and he tried all these things and finally lowered this per word uh, cross entropy measure by a bit. So um, I, I aspire to one day come up with a paper title as clever as this one. Um, then the, uh, the final thing that um, we use is perplexity. So perplexity um, is basically the entropy, um, the exponentiated entropy. And if you take log two, when you calculate the entropy, you, um, uh, you will exponentiate two. If you take log, uh, the natural log, when you take, uh, calculate the log probability, then you exponentiate E. Um, the fundamental um, idea behind perplexity is basically, um, it's not exactly like this, but it, it's, mo this is pretty accurate, is how many times would you have to randomly guess according to the probability distribution that you selected before you got the correct answer. So if your perplexity is 50 and then you ra made random guesses according to that probability distribution, you'd have to guess about 50 times before you got the correct, uh, the correct next word. Um, so the reason why this is important to know is um, at the very beginning of training, your perplexity should be a, approximately equal to your vocabulary size. Um, because if you're just randomly guessing things from the vocabulary, uh, you're going to get it right when you guess about the number of times it's a vocabulary size. So if for some reason your vocabulary size is 50 and your perplexity is 500,000, um, you have a bug in your code probably somewhere. So um, uh, for language modeling, um, really good perplexities nowadays are about 20 um, 20 per word, so you have to guess about 20 times before you get the actual next word. Um, for things like machine translation, really good perplexities are like two. So you would have to guess about two times before you got the next correct word. So, um, so what, can we do, uh, what can we do with language models? Um, language models can do a lot of things. Um, the first thing they can do is score sentences. Um, so uh, basically, if we have Jane went to the store and store to Jane went the, um, you can uh, give the first one a high score, the second one a low score. Um, you, this is basically the same as calculating a loss for training. Um, this can also be useful for a number of different things. Um, for example, like let's say you're uh, a non-native English speaker or even a native English speaker um, and you want to check whether the sentence you wrote is a good one. Um, language models are pretty good at this, um, minus the fact that, the, uh, that language models uh, tend to upweight frequent words. So they, if you use a slightly infrequent way of saying something, then it might mistakenly say that, um, that it's a grammatical error. Um, and there are ways to correct for this by um, uh, by normalizing by the overall frequency of the words, et cetera. But um, that's one clear cut application for language models that they're very good at. Um, there's also been recent, um, uh, recent interesting work. Um, there's a, for example, there's a paper called uh, Language Models as Knowledge Bases, where basically you say uh, Barack Obama was born in X and uh, you ask the language model to fill in the blank and it says Hawaii. And you can, uh, you can guess that Barack Obama was born in Hawaii according to all the text that you've read on the internet. So, you know, that's obviously a little bit dangerous because it's only as right as the text on the internet is right. Um, but, you know, uh, 
that's another uh, application. Um, another thing that language models can do is generate sentences. Um, and there's a very simple algorithm for this. Um, so while you haven't uh, picked this uh, end of sentence symbol uh, that indicates that you've reached the end of the sentence, you calculate the probability, and then you sample a new word uh, from the probability distribution. And you just do this over and over and over again. Um, if you want to play around with this, uh, there's a, um, a nice page that uh, allows you to easily do this um, with near state-of-the-art language models. The page is um, talktotransformer.com. So you can put in, um, uh, Graham is giving a lecture on, and it will, uh, it will generate the text for you. <laughs> I'm really glad this is, uh, I've had my own demos not work, but I've not had anybody else's demo not work. <laughs> But uh, Graham is giving a lecture on his 2012 Ayn Rand Lifestyle and Ethics book. This matches from the Objectivist Circle at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. For more information on the lecture, click here. <laughs> so, so it's pretty good if you ignore the fact that it's completely lying um, uh, and definitely not, uh, not, correct, uh, not correct whatsoever. But if you want to see uh, the capabilities of kind of modern uh, language models, you can, uh, you can take a look. Okay, so uh, let's uh, go back. Um, are, th are there any questions so far? Yes. Is this the kind of thing that is used in Gmail while we are? Is this the kind of thing that's used in Gmail while you're um, to okay. generate your responses? And long story short, um, yes, but it is a highly engineered version of this. So as you noticed here, it, um, if you just talk to transformer, it gives you these very, it gives you certain, um, you know, incorrect outputs. Um, it uh, might even give you extremely bad things that you definitely wouldn't want Gmail suggesting you reply to people. Um, what they do in Gmail is they train on, um, they train on email inputs and responses. And um, they generate according to this, but they only generate things that have already been pre-approved as being appropriate. Uh, so they basically search among the things that have been pre-approved as appropriate. And they also have some things uh, to try to make sure you get a positive and a negative, um, a positive and a negative response. Because if all of them are like, yes, that sounds great, sure. Uh, if you don't want to say yes, then you know, you're kind of stuck. So th it's, um, it's basically this, but highly engineered. Um, I don't know about the grammar correction in Gmail, uh, in Google Docs, but I suspect it's also doing something uh, similar. So. That's a good question. Any other, any other ones? Would it generate the same sentence if you give it the same Would it generate the same sentence? If you give it the same seed? If you gave it the same random seed, then yes. Um, but if you, if you gave it the same text, no, it generates a new one every time. Um, Yeah, so um, there's actually two ways to do search. I'm going to talk about these a little bit in, a, in a, another class. But this is uh, randomly sampling according to the probability distribution. Um, the other way to do search is to find the highest probability output. Um, from the point of view of a language model, the highest probability output, if you don't add any introductory sentence, is always probably like hello or something really boring. So if you want to actually see the outputs of the language model, then sampling is a way. Uh, actually see the probability distribution induced by the language model, then sampling is the way to go. Um, but like for translation, you might very often want the highest probability output. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, uh, when we talk about condition generations. Uh, good question, so any other ones? OK, I'll move on. So, um, so as I mentioned, there's, um, there's a big problem uh, with uh, kind of count-based language models. And um, one of the problems is they cannot share strength among similar words. So for example, let's say we have she bought a car. And this is a really common sentence in our training data. So we, we've learned it well. We know 
uh, the probability pretty, uh, pretty accurately. And then we also have she bought a bicycle. And bicycle is a little bit less common, so we've observed it a little bit less. We're a little bit less confident in our probability estimates. Um, we have she purchased a car. Similarly, uh, we've seen it a couple times, um, but uh, we're not very confident. And then we have she purchased a bicycle, which we've never seen before in our outputs. Um, so basically, if we get in this situation, um, if we just have a count-based model, uh, we're in trouble uh, because it's never seen purchased a bicycle. So it's just going to fall back to randomly picking a word, more or less. Um, so there's a solution to this um, elucidated or like explained in a bit of progress in uh, language modeling. And it's class-based language models where instead of building them over individual words, you build them over classes of words and, and somehow uh, predict the word itself from its class. Um, this is, again, a non-neural approach. It's a symbolic approach. Um, another problem. You cannot uh, condition on context with intervening words. So like, let's say you have a rare word intervening between uh, two words that are indicative. So you've seen Dr. Jane Smith in your training data, but you've never seen Dr. Gertrude Smith. So um, if this is the case, you know Dr. Something Smith is actually really common. It's much more likely than chance. Um, but you don't, um, you don't know the word Gertrude, so you fall back and kind of randomly guess a word. So there was also a solution to this um, before neural models came around called skipgram language models. This is different from the skipgram in word to vec So uh, word to vec is very confusing in this way, uh, it, like overloaded uh, this terminology. But basically what it would do is it would say, I'm not going to look at the previous word, but I'm going to look at two previous words. Another thing, uh, ngram models can't handle long distance dependencies. So they can't handle dependencies that move beyond um, move beyond the n that we limited them to modeling. So um, we have things like uh, for tennis class, he wanted to buy his own racket. For programming class, he wanted to buy his own computer. Um, so if you said you wanted to buy a, a programming uh, a racket for a programming class or a computer for a tennis uh, class, sure, you might be able to think of a possible world where that was the right thing to do, but it's pretty impossible, right? So. Um, so there were solutions to this also, um, cache models, trigger models, topic models, syntactic models. Um, but all of these required engineering and they weren't necessarily easy to combine with all of the previous ones. So um, I think this is interesting and the reason why neural networks are so powerful is not because we didn't have solutions to all of these problems before, but because it's so easy to come up with solutions that solve um, all of these problems in a much more clean and elegant framework than uh, what we would have been able to do uh, in, in the past. So um, an alternative uh, to n-gram models, for example, to ones that just count and divide, are featureized models. Um, these featureized models uh, basically calculate some sort of feature of the context. Um, and based on the feature, they calculate probabilities. And you can optimize these feature weights using uh, gradient descent or any other sort of feature uh, you know, optimization algorithm. And to give an example, um, let's say we have uh, the previous words giving, uh, giving a, like Graham is giving a lecture or giving a talk. Um, so we think of some features uh, to predict the next word. And our first feature is just a bias. It's basically saying how likely is the next word overall. Um, and the words like a uh and the are very likely, so we, um, uh, so we give them a high bias. Um, but however, given that the previous word was a, uh, it's very unlikely to have a uh or the, uh, right? Where, you know, that not only cancels out the probability of a uh and the, uh, but it says we're pretty sure this is not going to be the next thing. Um, so these would get high negative things, and then nouns like talk and hat and gift would get, you know, a slight positive uh, boost. And then uh, given that two pre the word uh, two previous was giving, now we're going to be more likely to have something that is likely to be given, right? So we might be giving a talk, we might be giving a gift. Um, we're a little bit less likely to be giving a hat. Um, so this is a, a very simple uh, featureized model. And we've basically defined features given uh, this word, given the previous word, and given two previous words. Um, so. We combine these together into a total score. 
and we calculate uh, something called the softmax, um, where basically the softmax it exponentiates all of these scores and then divides by the sum of the exponentiated scores. And what this does is this converts this into a well-formed probability distribution, and the conditions of a well-formed probability distribution are, are twofold. Um, that uh, all the numbers are between 0 and 1, and that it adds up to 1. And the way the softmax guarantees this is by um, exponentiating, you make everything positive, and then by dividing by the normalization constant, it ensures uh, everything adds to 1. So um, if we view this in a computation graph, um, like I talked about last time, um, we have two different lookup tables. Um, one lookup table is for the features of the previous, um, of two previous words, or the word two uh, words ago. The second lookup table is for the word one word ago. Um, the bias uh, is the same every time, so we don't have to look anything up. We just use it as a vector. We add all of them together and get scores, take a softmax, and get a probability. So what does this look like from last, uh, last class? Yeah, it looks like the bag of words model. So you know, we have one vector of equal size to the, um, to the output space. Um, it's a little bit different than the bag of words model because we're not adding up uh, these order independent. We're actually paying attention to order, but it, it looks a lot like the bag of words. So um, what do I mean when I say look up here? Um, and basically what I mean by this is it can be viewed as grabbing a single vector from a big matrix. So like, let's say we have um, the, the size of the vector um, is equal to 5 in this case, and then the, um, the number of rows in the matrix is 5, the number of columns is the number of words in our vocabulary, and we just take the, um, let's say we're 0 indexing. If we did look up 2, then we would take the second, um, or sorry, the third uh, element. Uh, third uh, column of this matrix. Um, an alternative interpretation of this is to view this as multiplication. And what we do instead is we have the number of words um, times the vector size, and we multiply this by a vector that is of size 1. Uh, sorry, uh, that is of the size equal to the, um, uh, the number of words in the vocabulary. And uh, we have a 1 in only one of those uh, places in the, in the vocabulary. So um, practically, um, all neural network libraries will be implementing the former. Um, and the reason why is because it's, uh, it's faster. It's more efficient. We don't need to do a big multiplication when most of our multiplication is zero. Um, however, the second view can be useful theoretically when you start wanting to do more complicated things. So like an example of a more complicated thing would be um, taking a probability distribution over word embeddings. Um, taking uh, or taking the bag of words um, from a sentence, uh, counting the number of times a word appears in a sentence, and multiplying that vector by the um, uh, by the output here um, by the word embedding matrix to get the sum of all the word embeddings in, in that sentence. So um, the second view can also be useful, but um, you should be using the first most of the time. So um, to train the model. Uh, we need to calculate a loss function, which is a measure of essentially how bad our predictions are, and update the parameters to uh, minimize this loss. And um, the most common loss function is uh, negative log likelihood. So basically, we take um, the probability of the, uh, of the correct element, we take its negative log, and this corresponds to its loss. So if we have a probability very close to 1, uh, the log becomes 0, our loss becomes very And then uh, parameter update, uh, like I talked about before, backpropagation allows us to calculate the derivative of this loss with respect to the parameters. Uh, so we calculate this, and we do uh, stochastic gradient descent um, that optimizes the parameters according to the following rule, like this. <coughs> OK, so this is a, a very brief overview. Um, I, I hope this was. Um, the overall view of training was uh, familiar to most people. Um, again, if it was not, that's fine. Um, but it would be good to read the uh, lecture notes very carefully and talk with the TAs um, if you need to catch up on these things. Um, I'm going to be talking um, a little bit more about like NLP-related things uh, uh, that you might not necessarily know if you just took a deep learning class uh, in the next part. But are there any questions so far?
Okay. So next, um, I'll be choosing a. Um, I'll talk about choosing a vocabulary. So um, one problem that we can face is unknown words. So the definition of an unknown word in a language model is a word that doesn't appear in our vocabulary. Um, and usually our vocabulary is made by uh, looking at all, all of the words in the training data, um, or maybe looking at all of the words in the training data and then thresholding at some point to reduce our vocabulary to a particular size. So um, uh, unfortunately, we won't have all of the word, uh, words in the world in our training data. Um, if we... Uh, if you don't believe me, then I can make up a word like neural netify or something like this, which you have never heard before, um, but you can kind of guess what it means. Um, so, you know, new words get invented all the time. We're never going to have all of them uh, covered. So uh, kind of by definition, we'll have things in our test data um, that we, we won't be able to cover. Another thing is, um, Especially with respect to neural networks, um, larger vocabularies require more memory and co computation time. So kind of uh, by necessity, we have to limit the size of our vocabularies as well. Um, so there's a, a number of common ways to do this. Um, the first way is a, a frequency threshold. So we say, you know, within, um, uh, we're going to take all of the words that appear in our training corpus only once, and we're going to say all of them are quote unquote unknown words, a special unknown word class. And um, we're not going to try to predict them, but rather we're going to try to predict the unknown word class. Um, another thing is a, uh, a rank threshold. So we say, OK, we want a vocabulary size of 40,000. That's all we can handle computationally. Um, and everything that's below uh, rank 40,000, we remove from our vocabulary and replace with this unknown. Um, another thing that um, has been uh, increasingly popular recently is actually taking uh, words that aren't in our vocabulary and splitting them up into smaller pieces. Um, I realize now that maybe I should have added these to my slides here, but um, we'll talk about that in more detail later. So I, I won't talk about that at this uh, time point. Um, from the point of view of evaluating your model, um, it's important that the vocabulary um, must be the same over the models you compare, or um, all models must be able to generate the test set. Um, so for example, if you, um, if you have a, um, if you have a word-based model, and in both your training set and test set, you, um, or your test set looks like this, Um, if you're making words unknown in your test set, it will, um, your test set will basically be pre-processed to look like something like this. So um, let's say you had a word-based model, um, and you were asking your word-based model to produce I will unk it. Um, this is not hard to produce because, you know, you know that verbs can sometimes be unknown words. Um, the probability of unk here will be relatively high. But if you have a character-based model and you ask your character-based model to produce, I will, I will neural netify it, that's a lot harder, right? It needs to predict this word that it's never seen before. Um, so that would be unfair to the character-based model. Um, so if you want to compare like word-based models and character-based models, you should ask your character-based model to also generate unk, which is not very interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it would at least make the comparison fair. Um, so I, I said let's try it out. I, um, I won't actually try it out in class, but if you want to take a look, uh, we have uh, implementations of um, this. Um, on the code samples here. So again, we have code samples um, in both Dynet and PyTorch, and we have this log linear uh, language model here. Um, uh, that's pretty simple. It's uh, you know, 101 lines of Dynet, and um, oh, actually, we don't have it in PyTorch, but you can you can look at it. Um, you can look at it in Dynet if you'd like. Um, 
so, so if we look at this model, um, what are the problems that we pointed out with uh, language models that have been handled? Um, unfortunately, this model still can't share statistical strength between similar words. And the reason why it can't do so is like the bag of words model, all the parameters of the model are, are trained separately. Um, so you essentially um, will learn bought and purchased as completely different um, vectors in this parameter matrix. Um, it can solve the problem of not being able to condition on context with intervening words. So um, if you remember, we had a feature for what, were, what was the word two words ago. And if we look at the word two words ago being doctor, then that would have allowed us to upweight the probability of Smith. Um, and we still can't handle uh, long distance dependencies. <coughs> so in order to do this, um, we can move beyond linear models. And um, as I mentioned before, uh, when I was talking about the SIBO model, our linear model can handle uh, feature combinations. So if we have um, an example uh, like this, where we have, um, we, we're always deciding whether we want to give a high probability to the word tests. We have students take tests, teachers take tests. Sure, teachers take tests, but it's less common than students taking tests, I guess. Uh, students write tests. Um, sure, they might write tests also, but it's less common than teachers doing so, and teachers write tests. So you can see that none of the features that we would have put into our log linear language model would have been indicative enough to make, allow us to make this distinction. So this is in, uh, an X or problem, essentially, if you, uh, if you know about the typical uh, example from neural nets. Uh, both of the inputs have to either be correct or, uh, uh, or incorrect to, uh, to predict the outcome. So, um, so what can we do here? Um, so the first thing we could do is um, remember combinations as features. So um, this is in, indeed what people did in log linear language models before neural net language models were widely used, um, which is uh, remember uh, the combinations as features. Oh, uh, side, side note, the, per, the person who invented these log linear language models was Roni Rosenfeld, who's now the head of uh, MLD here. So um, if you see him say, hey, I heard about your language models until uh, He'll be confused or happy, I don't know which. Um, uh, so then the, um, uh, the other option is neural nets. And you can guess which one we're, uh, we're going to be using. So uh, neural language models, um, which were uh, basically introduced by Bengio et al. in 2004, um, the way they work is um, instead of looking up uh, the scores directly, they look up um, uh, embedding vectors for both of these words, um, and then they run them through a nonlinearity or multiple nonlinearities uh, to extract features, um, multiply this by weight matrix, add a bias, and get your scores. So this looks very familiar, right? This is just exactly the same thing we did as text classification um, with one uh, small change. And the small change here is that instead of uh, summing these together element-wise, uh, we are concatenating them. And the reason why this is useful is like exactly like we talked about before, the main difference between the log linear language model and the bag of words is it, it, uh, um, it considers order. And this also allows us to consider order by treating um, the, uh, the ones in the first part of the vector and the ones in the second part of the vector uh, is differently by concatenating. And then uh, again, we take the soft max and get the probabilities. So, um, the, the great thing about this is this allows us to, um, to share strength among similar words. Um, and the way it works is um, in the word embeddings, uh, similar words will get similar word vectors. So, you know, car and bicycle might get similar uh, vectors. Uh, bought, bought and purchased might get similar vectors. Also, um, similar output words. Um, words that tend to appear in similar contexts will get similar um, uh, rows in the softmax matrix. So for example, if, um, if car and bicycle um, appear in similar contexts, you might have a vector um, for car and a vector for bicycle uh, where like the great majority of the vector looks basically the same. And uh, 
only a small part of the vector is a little bit different, and this small part of the vector is used to distinguish between these two, uh, these two concepts. So, um, if you write like an expensive car versus an expensive bicycle, maybe you're more likely to, maybe the car will have a slightly higher weight on the like how expensive is it feature, for example, uh, because cars tend to be more expensive. Um, also, uh, yeah, so, sorry, I, I, skip, I should have mentioned this part first, but uh, similar contexts will get similar hidden states after the feature transformation. So um, this model can now um, share strength among similar words as well, as I mentioned. So now we fix two of the three problems that I pointed out, and all we have had to do is add a little bit of complexity uh, to our um, to our code here. So we have our uh, our language modeling code, and um, we uh, we look at the log linear language model, and um, we have this uh, calc score of history function where um, basically you um, <coughs> you, uh, you take the, the previous words, um, you get factors, and you, um, you uh, pen them together. Um, and uh, if you, uh, that was with the log linear language model, and if you have the neural net uh, language model, let's see. Instead, you uh, concatenate them, you do in the FN transform, and you, you take a tan H and multiply instead. So you see we've gone through, um, we've gone through like two small changes in the code, and that has fixed, um, that's fixed a problem that people wrote whole papers or like whole series of papers about uh, before we had neural nets as a tool. So I think that speaks well to their, um, their you know, power in this respect. Cool. Um, so um, another another thing I can note is that uh, recently it's very common to tie the input and output embeddings. And what I mean by this is um, we have uh, the the lookup embeddings and the softmax embeddings. And if you remember in the interpretation of the embeddings that I was talking about in the like what is lookup slide. Um, I was talking about how this um, uh, this embedding matrix, lookup embedding matrix, was a big matrix uh, which was like size um, size of the embedding uh, times the vocabulary. Um, and the softmax is basically a similar matrix, which is size of the embedding um, times the vocabulary size. Um, and they're the same shape. Uh, each element, uh, each column here and each row there um, corresponds to a single word. So we might as well just say, let's order the words in the same way and uh, use the transpose of this as your thing in the softmax. Um, so, uh, so you can share the parameters here, and this proves to be very effective. Um, it usually gives you better results, and it makes your model much smaller because these embeddings actually take a lot of space if your uh, if your vocabulary size is relatively large. So, yeah, and you can you can try this in the uh, in the example code if you like. Okay, are there uh, any questions about these things? Okay. Um, so uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about optimization. Um, so up until now, I was talking about um, SGD, standard SGD optimization. And just a reminder, um, standard stochastic gradient descent does the following. <coughs> it first uh, calculates a gradient. I'm, I'm sorry, the terminology has shifted a little bit here. So I'll redefine all of these things. But it basically calculates the gradient of the loss. So if we say L is the loss function, uh, theta t minus 1 is our previous uh, parameters. Uh, the gradient that we're going to use at uh, time step t is, uh, we'll define it as gt. Um, and then um, we uh, take the previous parameters and we subtract this gradient uh, multiplied by a learning rate eta. Um, 
Um, so this is, this is very simple. Um, but there are many other uh, op optimization options. And there's a really nice uh, blog post, um, which is also linked in the references, that explains all of these different ones. Um, I'm just going to go through a few of the more important ones here, because this blog post has like 40 of them in there. And you probably don't need to know every single one of them at this time if you're not uh, already familiar. Um, so the first one is, um, is SGD with momentum. And the basic idea is you remember gradients from past time steps. And the reason why you might want to do this is because um, uh, one of the problems with SGD is, uh, or um, one, one of the issues with SGD compared to like uh, calculating gradients over your whole data set and then, um, then taking a step in that direction, SGD only uses a subset of the data set, you know, only one or only a few examples. And because of this, the gradients you get are very noisy. They, um, you know, you might happen to get a bunch of examples that all contain similar words. So you'll take a big step in the direction of using those words heavily when actually, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, and, uh, or like to give, to give another example, maybe um, you happen to get a whole bunch of really long sentences um, in a row. And because of that, uh, you'll, uh, you'll have um, your model like overfit to long sentences and then not work as well on other ones. So um, uh, basically what momentum does is it remembers the gradients from the past time steps. So we have a, a rolling average of the gradients where we take the gradient from this time step and this V is for uh, velocity. And um, we, uh, we multiply this <coughs> by this decay term uh, gamma. And uh, this decay term gamma will be like 0 0.9 or something like that. So it will uh, reduce the velocity that we had last time and add the, uh, add the current gradient. So um, because of this, basically, you'll be, you'll be continuing your momentum from the previous time with respect to optimization and make a smoother trajectory through the space. Um, so, uh, yeah, and uh, then you add this momentum uh, based term into your optimization. Um, the intuition is preventing instability from sudden changes. Um, one problem with this is now you have a new hyperparameter to, uh, to optimize this, uh, this decay term. Yeah? How do you define or initialize this velocity? Um, a zero should be fine. So the reason why zero is fine is because basically um, you're starting uh, you're starting out with uh, no velocity whatsoever, and you gradually add more as um, uh, as uh, you continue. Um, I'm going to talk about Adam a little bit later, and Adam does something slightly different. Um, but as far as as far as I know, maybe somebody can correct me on this, but I think it's usually initialized. Um, okay, so for, uh, for Adagrad, um, Adagrad is a little bit uh, different in that the idea is that it wants to uh, reduce variance by changing the learning rate. Instead of keeping around momentum for the previous time, it changes the learning rate of each parameter based on how confident you are in the parameters. So um, the first thing we do is we define um, uh, this large GT. And what this large GT is is basically the sum of the uh, the sum of the squares of the gradients. So we're taking a square here. So if you don't do any update whatsoever, um, you uh, you get a zero. So this uh, the sum doesn't change. Um, but if you do do an update, if you do a very large update, this um, this increases. If you do a small update, this doesn't increase very much. And then the final update rule looks a little bit like this. Um, and what you're doing is you're taking the standard um, SGD update rule, but you're dividing by the square root of this accumulated gradient term uh, plus a small constant. And this small constant is just there to prevent you from dividing by zero, basically. So, um, uh, so the idea here is um, things that get updated more with larger, um, with larger gradients, their learning rate gets decreased. Um, and there's a very intuitive explanation uh, for this if you think about word embeddings in particular. So um, if you know NLP or you know ling uh, language, um, there's something called zips law. So um, the, uh, the rank 
of the word and the frequency of the word um, are inversely correlated like this, where you know the less frequent words are much, much less common than the, um, than the very frequent words. Um, and so you go through your uh, entire corpus and you see the very frequent words in every sentence. You see the and a uh in virtually every sentence. So you have a very good concept of what their word embedding should look like. So let's, let's say you get a, a slightly unusual uh, form of the word the. Um, like an example of that would be the last sentence where I use the as a noun instead of a determiner. But um, uh, like in that case, you don't want to make a huge jump in parameter space uh, to fix that one example. Um, but fortunately, because you've updated the a lot already, the squared gradient um, is large. So you divide by that squared gradient, and then you don't update very much. However, if you have a rare word, um, like let's say my last name, Newbig, is a rare word, um, you see that only once or twice in your entire corpus. So when you do see it, you want to make a big update to its parameters. So um, what this does is it basically you know, divides by essentially how often you've seen it, how much you've updated it to, to make that intuition happen. Um, there is one problem with Adagrad. Um, and the problem with Adagrad is this is a um, monotonically increasing function, right? So this will only increase. It will never decrease. So as training goes on, it keeps on reducing and reducing and reducing the learning rate. Um, and because of this, training can tend to stall and you just stop learning, um, especially on very frequently updated parameters. So um, there are... Um, methods that fix this, um, some examples include Ada Delta and RMS prop that instead take the rolling average of the gradient. So they don't um, just accumulate it, but rather uh, rather take the rolling average. Um, yeah? Uh, wouldn't there be an issue in case uh, uh, the value of small gt becomes too small? In that case, uh, like the gradient becomes too small. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, on uh, capital GT, the under root of it would be larger, so it would further even like it would even further reduce the value that was being updated in our So, like in case of vanishing gradient, the problem would be just maximum. Well, so that, that's a good point. So, in um, if small gt becomes very small, when uh, reiterating the question, if small gt becomes very small, wouldn't the problem become even worse? And the answer is yes. And uh, that becomes a problem because as you train more. Um, your loss function tends to decrease, and your gradients tend to get smaller. So the big GT that you accumulated at the very beginning of training, when your gradients are large, remains large. Um, but your uh, your gradients at the end of training, uh, small GT gradients at the end of training become small. So yes, basically, um, that's a problem, and that's a reason why very few people use Adagrad anymore. Um, so, but this all kind of. Um, was uh, a lead up into Atom. Um, and this is what a very large number of people use um, nowadays. And um, basically, it's, um, it, it considers both the rolling average of the gradient and the momentum. So um, we have our momentum term. This momentum term is essentially uh, very similar to uh, the momentum term in SGD with momentum, uh, the only difference being that it um, <coughs> it makes this, uh, these two parameters tight. So the higher your uh, parameter here, the more update you do with the, uh, with the gradient here, uh, the less update you do uh, with this, um, uh, with the previous update uh, gradients. Um, and uh, similarly, we have a rolling average of the variance. And um, so this is momentum, this is rolling average of the gradient. Um, there's also a thing for correcting bias early in training. So this kind of ties into like how do you see the momentum at the very beginning. And basically, um, the problem with this is um, this MT term at the very beginning of training, this is going to be set to zero. Um, and because this is going to be set to zero, like let's say this uh, beta 1 uh, was 0 0.999 or something like this, or beta 2, I, I believe, is set to 0 0.999 frequently. That would mean you'd have a very, very slow start uh, with respect to this rolling average. So basically, they correct for this um, by dividing by, uh, dividing by uh, this 1 minus uh, v1 uh, to the t or uh, 1 minus v2 to the t value here to correct so that at the beginning of training, you still get reasonably large uh, values for this. Um, 
And then the final update uh, basically looks like this. It looks very similar to, uh, to Adagrad, except now instead we're using the rolling average, uh, we're using the momentum, um, and we're using the rolling average of the gradient instead of the, the actual uh, um, accumulated gradient. Um, this has some hyperparameters. Um, uh, I'm not 100% confident in this, but I believe this is zero point set, very often set to 0 0.9. This is very often set to 0 0.999. Um, so this accumulates quickly and this accumulates slowly. Am I getting this wrong backwards or am I right? That's right? Okay, good. Um, I, I'm very nervous talking about this in front of like 90 people in the class and getting it wrong. But, um, so, uh, so yes, um, and that epsilon again is a small constant just to prevent you from dividing this. Yes? The same situation between the beta and the one minus beta? Oh, what is the intuition of the beta and the one minus beta? I think probably the biggest intuition here is simply that if you made these parameters separate, um, you would have two extra parameters that you needed to tune. Um, but uh, another kind of intuition behind it is um, you're adding in new things and you're removing old things. So the amount of new things that you should add in is approximately, you know, inversely, I wouldn't say inversely proportional, but it, it should be, you know, an inverse of, uh, not inverse. If it's larger, the other value should be smaller. So um, I don't know if this is coming across uh, <laughs> well. Oh, so well, so I guess um, if you think of MT as the momentum, you can either so like let's say we set beta one to zero. Um, if we set beta one to zero, there would be no momentum, and you would just use the current gradients. Um, if we set beta one to a very, very, a value very, very close to one, like 0 0.999, then you would be almost entirely be using momentum. Um, uh, you would almost entirely be using the momentum and you would only, to a very small extent, be using the current gradients. And I guess another reason why this is good is, um, uh, yeah, another reason why this is good is the scale will stay, stay approximately the same throughout the entire training. So, um, because it always adds up to one, like let's say you get to the point where the momentum is approximately equal to the gradients on the right. Um, if you get to that point, then you know by adding in one and reducing the other, you won't be like accumulating more momentum than you had before. So actually, that's probably the better explanation. You know, the scale if the scale of the two vectors is approximately the same, the momentum will always stay in the same range. So. Um, that's a good question that I ha obviously hadn't thought about carefully before, but now I'm satisfied with that. So, so. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple training tricks. I'm actually starting to starting to run out of time, so I'll go a little bit quickly uh, through the rest. Um, but um, there are certain things that you definitely should be doing um, always. There are certain things that you should be doing almost always. Uh, most of the stuff I talk about here is very good stuff to know. Uh, shuffling the training data is something you should be doing always. Um, and what this means is um, because stochastic gradient methods update the data a little bit at a time, either one example or a small mini batch of examples, um, if you have some underlying order to your data and you do not shuffle the data, this can become a big problem. So like, let's say you had a big uh, corpus of news text and then you had another big corpus of Twitter. Um, if you just concatenated the news text in the Twitter text, and then you did, uh, you went through it from top to bottom, by the time you got to the end of the news text, you would have a very newsy language model. Um, but then when you switched over to the Twitter text, by the time you got to the end of the Twitter text, you'd have a very Twittery language model. And like, let's say you stopped training at the end of the, at the, end of the file, um, you would have a model that only knows Twitter and doesn't know anything about things. So um, intuitively, that's the reason why. Also, um, you know, theoretically, it's necessary to assume uh, that your data is sampled um, without, uh, it's, it's sampled uh, randomly. And it actually even needs to be sampled um, with replacement. So that means that you don't just shuffle the data, but you randomly s uh, sample different uh, uh, things, um, uh, a different one every time. Um, but in practice, shuffling is more common because it allows a more uniform look at the data and um, 
uh, tends to allow uh, things to converge faster. Um, also, um, overfitting. So uh, a big problem you're going to face is overfitting. And that's where the loss uh, decreases on the training data, but it does not uh, decrease on the test data, or it doesn't decrease on the test data as much as you'd like. Um, neural networks have tons of parameters, and we want to prevent them from overfitting. So how do we do so? Um, the first way, um, and maybe most effective way, is early stopping. And basically what this means is um, we don't continue training um, forever. We continue training only until the accuracy plateaus or peaks on a set of data that's not included in our training data. Um, so we monitor performance on held out data and stop training when it starts to get worse. Um, another thing is learning rate decay. So um, learning rate decay basically gradually uh, reduces the learning rate as training continues. Or alternatively, you can reduce the learning rate um, when the dev performance plateaus. So basically, if your dev accuracy gets worse or it stops getting better, um, you can uh, reduce the learning rate at that point. Um, another important concept is patience. Um, and patience basically means that you don't immediately do early stopping um, when the dev set, uh, when the dev performance plateaus. Um, but you wait five more iterations. You evaluate it five more times or something if you have a patience of five uh, before uh, re um, stopping or reducing the learning rate. And the reason why this is important particularly is because um, it, it's particularly important for neural nets. It's also important for convex models, but um, neural nets are optimizing non-convex functions. They do a lot of kind of exploring and um, the dev performance at the very beginning will kind of monotonically increase, but then as you get later, it might still be increasing, but it might decrease on some dev set evaluation. So you just want to give it a little bit of extra time before um, cutting it off. Um, oops. And yes, yeah. Yes, Sorry. No. There that it will increase again, or yeah, the hope there is uh, that it will increase again. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, um, sorry, actually, this is a little bit of a non sequitur. This was meant to be in the, um, in the uh, uh, optimizers section. Um, so I would recommend, if you're doing just about anything, um, to just use Atom and not worry about it. Uh, it's relatively stable with the default parameters, um, and it will work for ex uh, any, you know, just about any experiment you run. Um, that being said, if you absolutely want to get the best accuracy, there's a couple ways you could do this. Um, either by tuning Adam's parameters, uh, changing the parameters to something um, else. A good guide for this is what did the people who wrote the paper that you're referencing do? And uh, they probably did some sort of search um, as well. Um, also, um, some people have noted that adaptive gradient methods like Adam uh, tend to overfit uh, to some extent. So they train more quickly, but they tend to overfit. And uh, well-tuned, simple SGD uh, can generalize better in some cases. And there's a nice paper referenced in the, uh, 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 here. Um, you should definitely use learning rate decay of some kind. I tend to use it on the dev set. Um, and we have some experiments in machine translation uh, that do atom and SGD with learning rate decay. Um, and find that Atom, if you do learning rate decay with Atom, uh, does better than SGD in, with respect to generalization. So this is like in contrary to this previous work here that says SGD is better. Um, but you know, I think a lot of this is case by case. Um, so if you really want the best performance, you need to tune the hyperparameters. But if you just want something that works, I just use Atom. Um, dropout. So um, dropout is something that's really important. It's relatively simple conceptually, and all neural network frameworks implement it, so it's easy to apply. Um, what dropout does is it basically randomly zeroes out nodes in the hidden layer um, with a probability p. Um, but it does this only at training time. So what this looks like conceptually is basically you have a bunch of nodes in the, um, in the neural network, and you randomly delete some of them. Uh, and set them to zero. And the reason 
why you do this basically is to prevent um, the model from uh, overfitting by for, uh, memorizing examples. Uh, and uh, one way you could think of memorizing examples is basically identifying each example by some unique characteristic and um, setting a single node in the neural network or a few nodes in the neural network to identify that example. Um, and there's a very interesting paper. Um, uh, it's not without problems, but it's a very interesting paper to read uh, called um, uh, uh, Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization, which shows, um, this paper basically shows understanding, yeah. Um, and basically it shows that um, you can train neural networks to completely memorize the data, uh, despite the fact that the labels have no correspondence to the input data whatsoever. So they took image classification task, they randomly shuffled the labels, so the labels had no correspondence with the input whatsoever, and they were still able to overfit the training data and achieve uh, perfect accuracy on this task after a certain amount of time. Um, so uh, dropout, it doesn't completely prevent this, but it, it prevents it substantially by basically making it a harder learning problem and not allowing you to rely on like individual nodes of the network to, to memorize particular examples. Um, one thing to be a little bit careful of is um, neural network toolkits will implement uh, dropout functions. If you implement it yourself by just saying, like, I want to do a random sampling and zero out nodes, uh, you need to be aware that um, you also need to do scaling. Um, so what this means is basically if you have a dropout rate of 0 0.5, the scale of the uh, whole hidden vector is going to be half the size during training time than it is at test time. So you, you basically either have to scale um, by the probability at test time to in increase, uh, to decrease the, the scale of the vectors, or um, scale by one divided by one minus the probability at training time to upweight the vectors at training time so they match the scale at test time. So um, uh, finally, an alternative uh, called drop connect uh, instead zeroes out weights in the RNN. So um, instead of zeroing out nodes, it zeroes out uh, elements in the weight matrices. Um, this isn't super widely used uh, as far as I know, but the one advantage of it is um, you do it once on your parameters, and then the entire neural network for the rest of the um, uh, for the rest of the training doesn't change. So this is really nice. Um, for example, if you have a highly optimized uh, GPU implementation of an LSTM, and there's no way you can add dropout to the middle of the LSTM, but you can drop out the parameters before feeding them into the LSTM. Um, so uh, I'll I'll talk about LSTMs later. I guess Hero will talk about LSTMs later. Um, but uh, that's uh, in particular why it's used. And I mentioned it here not because it's widely used, but because it's used in a case study that I'm going to talk about at the very end. Um, and yeah, and we have code that, uh, that demonstrates some of these optimizations. Um, are there any questions uh, so far? I'll be talking more about overfitting and how to prevent it, um, not just through training tricks, but also through you know, better model design and stuff like that throughout the class. So, um, uh, we can detect that later. Okay, um, uh, one final thing is efficiency. And this is really, really important. Um, if, you, if you know about batching, um, uh, that's great. If you don't know about batching, this is something you'll definitely have to learn to do the assignments in any reasonable amount of time. And um, the basic intuition here is that on modern hardware, um, doing kind of doing a for loop over 10 operations of size one, uh, like multiplying uh, 10 sets of integers together through a Python for loop is going to be much, much slower than doing a single uh, operation over two vectors of size, uh, of size 10. Um, so um, this is especially true on GPUs. So GPUs are um, massively parallel computation machines. They can do like 256 or 512 or whatever um, operations in exactly the same amount of time they can do one operation. Um, even on modern CPUs, um, modern CPUs have something called single instruction multiple data operations that allow you to do a similar thing. It's just at a smaller scale. Um, 
So what mini batching does is it combines together smaller operations into one big one. So an example of this would be like if you have um, uh, your kind of standard neural network layer, which has uh, data number one multiplied by a weight matrix times uh, plus a bias. Uh, data number two times the same weight matrix plus a bias. Data number three times the same weight matrix plus a bias. All of them get a 10H. Um, what you do is you take all of these individual operations for individual data points. You uh, concatenate together all the data points into a matrix. Um, and then you do something called broadcasting to um, like kind of artificially uh, match the size of the vector uh, B um, to uh, be the same size. And then you do the, this kind of one set of big operations instead of uh, a bunch of different sets of little operations. And this is super, super important. This speeds things up um, uh, by a, a huge amount. Um, when you want to do this manually, uh, the way you do this is you group similar operations together and execute them uh, all. So like in the case of a feed-forward language model, um, the word, each word prediction is an independent operation. You take the previous n words, um, you concatenate their vectors together, um, you calculate a softmax, and you calculate the probabilities. Um, for something like a RNN, or some sort of more complicated model that looks at the whole sentence, basically each sentence uh, becomes an operation, and you batch together multiple sentences uh, worth of computation. Um, how this works uh, depends on the toolkit. Most toolkits um, uh, work in, on tensors, like I mentioned before. So they take, um, uh, they take a vector, and they extend it by one, um, uh, one um, uh, dimension and, uh, and do operations over this. Um, there's also um, something called automatic uh, mini-batching, which I'll talk about later. Um, so, an example of a mini-batched uh, code would look something like this. So, in regular code, you would add up word one and word two. Um, you'd look them up. You can concatenate them together, uh, multiply them by a weight matrix, add a bias. Um, what you would do instead is, like, if you have multiple examples where each example has um, uh, the first word and the um, second word, the first word and the second word, the first word and the second word, um, you would look up all the first words in a batch, look up all the second words in a batch, still concatenate the batches together, uh, sum them, and, uh, and take, the, uh, take the loss margin. So you can see the computation looks very similar, except the, um, the very first part, where you convert it into a, a batched uh, data structure. And we have a code example for this as well. Um, there's also methods to automatically optimize this process. Um, these are useful because a very large amount of your implementation time can be spent on figuring out how to batch uh, operations together. Um, so one example of this, um, sorry, I, um, this is an animated, uh, an animated GIF. Um, but basically, uh, let, me, let me show it on here. So the way, um, the way it works basically is, um, oops. Um, instead of doing the batching yourself, um, what you do is you expand a whole bunch of, um, you expand a whole bunch of computation graphs um, one by one. So you, you create each computation graph, for example, a computation graph for differently linked sentences. Um, and you calculate your loss function. And basically, the, um, uh, the underlying neural network toolkit will go in and uh, batch all of these things together for you. So this is very useful if you want to do kind of complicated, uh, complicated procedures over trees or graphs or other things like this, and it's really starting to become onerous to, uh, to do all of the batching yourself. Um, there's a, a couple instantiations of this. Um, one instantiation is in Dynet, uh, like I mentioned before. Um, a, another instantiation is in TensorFlow, and this is called TensorFlow Fold. So both of these um, 
uh, both of these are ways to do auto, uh, automatic matching. Um, and so the way the way this works is basically for each data point in the mini batch, you uh, you do a for loop, you sum the losses together, um, you do uh, the forward pass and the backward pass, and it automatically um, uh, combines things together. And well, we have an evaluation in the in the paper we wrote about this, but uh, I'll skip that. Um, Another thing is um, recently, so PyTorch notably doesn't have this. And the reason why PyTorch doesn't have this is because it uses eager, uh, eager execution. And like I mentioned last time, eager execution basically executes something every time you define the graph. So there's no way to implement this um, without like writing a wrapper around PyTorch. Um, and uh, there's a couple ways to do this. One, um, one way to do this is there's people have written wrappers around PyTorch that basically um, execute um, like instrument PyTorch code for you uh, to try to um, to try to do this. But unfortunately, these are also written in Python, and Python is extremely slow, so you lose all the speed benefits you get from batching. Um, however, one thing that is useful. Um, I emailed my lab and nobody told me uh, if anybody uses this and nobody said yes, but um, presumably people are using this uh, in, in various places, but it's called TorchScript. And the idea is you, um, you create a PyTorch module and you call this uh, torch.jit.trace uh, function. And what it does is it, it reads this, um, this uh, code and it converts this into a limited version of Python. And this limited version of Python can then be compiled um, and optimized and stuff like this. And this, um, this works, um, but it only works as long as uh, the functions that you have in here are something that's supported by this just-in-time compiler. So um, uh, I think it will work for a fairly large range of kind of elementary operations or things like this, but um, it won't work for everything that you could possibly want to do. OK, so um, I have zero minutes, so I'll go through this very quickly. Um, so I, I talked about a whole bunch of things here. Um, and I wanted to talk about um, specifically how all of these can be combined together into something that's very effective. And one example of this is this regularizing and optimizing LSTM language models. And this is a, um, I'm, I've talked about, I've mentioned the LSTM, so we're going to talk about them in more detail later. Um, but basically, this is a language modeling uh, paper that uses uh, a standard model as a backbone, but it just tries really, really hard to optimize it well. And um, it uses all of the tricks that I mentioned here um, to improve stability and prevent overfitting, such as drop connect regularization, um, SGD with averaging triggering, triggered when the model is close to convergence, so kind of a special learn, learning rate uh, schedule, uh, dropout and recurrent connections and embeddings, uh, weight tying, like I mentioned. Um, independently tuned embedding and hidden layer sizes, um, regularization of the activations of the network, uh, et cetera. And by combining together all these tricks, you get a huge uh, gain in performance. So um, this is a good paper to read if you want to know a little bit about how somebody practically you know, put all of these things together to do a good job optimizing. So um, that is all. I'm sorry I'm one minute over time. I'll try not to do this very often, but, uh, but thank you for listening. And uh, see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.